Once again, Kagurabachi continues to impress, continues to build such beautiful characters so rapidly, so quickly, and make them memorable. What was a pretty stereotypical samurai architecture has now flipped back on itself to become so beautiful, so fulfilling, and filled to the brim with texture. Stuff that makes you love this character to their core, what they stand for, their beliefs, even how strong they are, how they operate, how they react within this world. They have this charm and authenticity about them that feels so natural. And that's what I love about uh, Hokazono, the author of Kagurabachi. His ability to be able to do that with every single character that he puts time into. And when I say time, I mean more so effort. Samura has been in this story for like three whole chapters, yet the amount that we got for him feels like so much more. It's an impressive accomplishment, and while it might not seem crazy to a lot of you, being able to do this repeatedly, multiple different times, back to back to back, is so incredibly impressive, but more importantly, a strong suit for character creation. A really recent example uh, is Kiora, and while he pillared as a central villain for that arc, Kiora's character feels oddly similar with the approach and style and authenticity that goes into it. There's an intention behind each each action that goes into creating a character that is memorable. Kyura's death, specifically its artistic approach, lingers in my mind very often for Kagurabachi. The same way that Samura's introduction is now lingering in my mind. It feels refreshing, and I absolutely adore that. How do we flip the blind swordsman concept though? Turns out Samura wasn't blinded by an accident, but by choice. It's a part of his beliefs. He blinded himself to turn his eyes away, quite literally, to worldly desires and passion. So on one side, you have him being true to himself, and his beliefs and allowing his judgment to flourish naturally because it's not clouded by exterior things, which in turn allows his blade to be the sharpest it can be. The funniest thing about it, however, is how he traverses over to the other side because a part of that whole belief would also encapsulate killing. He would not be able to kill people as that is also part of the anger and worldly passion and desires. So there's a bit of a contradiction. Samura obviously recognizes this, and it's why his character is kind of split perfectly down the middle on two different sides. The one I just mentioned, which is his belief side, and the other being his, I guess, action phase. Getting down to business, getting stuff done. Perhaps this would operate very well within the war and the sword that he would actually use. Being able to traverse back to his belief as a safe haven, as a Buddhist concept, so to speak, builds a really nice foundation. Lucky for us, we get to see that in full swing. What does that traversal look like? What happens when he leaves his beliefs behind or puts it on pause for a moment? You get a monster. Before we get there, however, we get to see the kind of sheer destruction and monstrosity of the Hishaku peasants uh, running the Dartenseki stone and attacking the fortress. I love that the design of this fortress is a full-blown temple, which is to be expected. You've seen all the monks running around and the Buddhist symbolism and architecture, so it's very heavily woven into every aspect of this fortress, which I think is really cool for where Samura is obviously stationed. I don't imagine that this was built around him, but more so perhaps he chose to go here, his beliefs obviously aligning with the temple. Now I really like the monks in here, I think they're great. I wish there was just a tiny bit more of them. That's just personal preference because when all of these peasants start to rock in with the Dan Seki, they're the ones standing guard and they're pretty overpowered as well, like you have a handful of monks and a lot more of these peasants right? And these monks know game. They know what they're doing. They actually bring the fortress to life in a really nice way using like the tile shingles on the roof as a way to capture the peasants when they run across it. Super cool way to perhaps show their connection to the temple. This is where we get to see Samura shine and there's a handful of things here that you might find rather fascinating. Firstly, just the basics, uh, Samura transitions out of his beliefs by inhaling a cigarette. It's a very cool way to transition. This is kind of the acknowledgement, symbolically, that he's leaving his beliefs behind by ripping this entire cigarette. That's that. It showcased at the beginning how Samura used to struggle with his desires when he first blinded himself. He's had this cigarette for show for the longest time. So I imagine this is how he transitions himself physically as like an actual action that he does. So it feels more sturdy and closey. Does that make sense? Almost like the physical action of opening a door and closing it behind you instead of metaphorically, instead of trying to transition just within your head. 
but something very cool happens right before it. See, a little bit later, you find out about Samura's abilities. Even though he's wielding a standard sword, he's incredibly powerful. And the amount of people that are coming to attack this fortress is like double slash triple the amount that the first fortress had with Uraha. Samura is the monster. He is the defense force. His abilities is hearing and echolocation. But the way he does it is with his sword, which is a drawing style called Aie or Ayato. I don't know actually how to pronounce it. And basically it's described as a Japanese martial art that emphasizes being aware and capable of quickly drawing the sword and responding to sudden attacks. It consists of four main components, the smooth, controlled movements of drawing the sword from its scabbard, striking or cutting an opponent, shaking blood from the blade, and replacing the sword back into the scabbard. And every time he unsheaths and clicks the sword back into the scabbard, that's what he uses to make noise so he can echolocate people surrounding him. I like this. What is interesting, though, is that before he transitions into his attack phase, everyone stops making noise. You'll notice that the monks back off a little bit, and their staffs that have these rings around them that jingle, and the chapter emphasizes this jingle very heavily, they stop moving it. The person that is sitting in front of this massive Buddha and its gong or little dish that it has that makes a really loud sound also stops before whacking the gong. I assume this is perhaps acknowledgement that Samura is about to deal with these people and to allow more clarity to his vision, they stop making unnecessary noise, which I find really cute because I also imagine that the jingles of the staffs that the monks have also allow Samura just to like understand and know where all the monks are in the actual temple. And obviously it's because of their beliefs and that showcase to respect, but perhaps in a more headcanon cute type of way, it allows Samura to quote unquote see his surroundings easier. Almost like they could potentially be doing it for him so he has a better vision of his environment. I don't know if he can constantly use echolocation but I imagine so just to get around normally and not just within his attack phase or while he's using his sword. And then what you get from it is incredible showcase of Samura's abilities. This man is a problem, an absolute monster. Even with these peasants having the Dantenseki stone, they're no match. This man just has a regular sword and still he strikes them down with such speed that they can't even dodge. They can't do anything. We also found out that Uraha is actually a student of Samura and uses a similar style. Not perfected, not to the same extent, but in the same vein. Of course, you can't have all of this beautiful showcase without some incredible artwork to go with, and Samura is just him. He's that guy, that monster. It's impeccable to see. And the final two panels, just to really kind of bring it all together nicely, him standing in front of the Buddha statue, dead bodies in front of him, and him acknowledging that he too is going to go to hell for killing people. Peak. Absolute perfection. I love singular panel spreads. Don't get me wrong, double spreads always hit, but there's something so beautiful about a singular panel that has the verticality to it. There's so much more of a design philosophy that I feel like goes into it, just captures the emotion, the aura so incredibly well. But lastly, just to sprinkle the best stuff on it, we get the name of his blade, Toby Mune. I don't know how to say that. Uh, we also get the name of his style, which is the IA White Purity Style Master, as well as his name, Seichi Samura. Now a couple of things that I could find, I'm not too sure of the accuracy of them, so take it with a little bit of grain of salt. For his name, a mixture of sit, village, pure, purify and cleanse as well as city uh, and his blade's name, Toby Mune, is to fly and religion slash sect. Also the essence and origin of something. I've seen a lot of people say that perhaps it is the bird sword. Which makes me curious, because of how his blindness works, I've always wondered how the sword would operate around it. Would it enhance it? Would it weaponize it? Would it make it easier? Would it give him different tools at his disposal so he can maximize the efficiency of his blindness? Does that make sense? Instead, maybe he doesn't actually need more sight, but more movement. Considering he draws the sword so fast and creates the sound himself so he can echolocate people, maybe a bird sword would be perfect for him to provide movement through the space at rapid speeds. You're looking at an even scarier individual here. The other option is that maybe he can just genuinely 
suddenly fly, which would be hilarious because he's blind. So I, I don't know, but there's a lot of options here and I'm interested to see if he does get it. But I am also a little bit concerned. I don't think the author would throw away a character like Samura, but honestly, you never really know. Put it like this, death flags crop up very quickly and Samura currently has a couple. They're not full mass, but they're definitely there. If there was a character that had to be killed off, it would be Samura which is hard to kind of swallow because of the incredible stuff that we got in this chapter, but perhaps it's because of what we got in this chapter. This would also add a lot of extra oomph to Uraha, who is a student to Samura. The effects of that potential death would be devastating and would push Uraha in a whole new realm of growth and evolution. And they're lucky that another named Hishaku member did not come along with them. So clearly they have stones and people and members at their disposal. They're playing a tricky game and allocating their pieces, what I think are pretty intelligently so far. While it hasn't worked for them yet at all, it does leave all of the sword bearers out in the open. Perhaps that is what the Hishaku are actually gunning for.